What is up, YouTube? It's your boy, Angel. Welcome to Universal Strength, where we transcend today for better tomorrows. In today's video, what I'm going to be doing is making a part two of functional training and why I think it doesn't exist. Stick around. So first off, let's just start by defining what functional strength is in a clinical setting. So functional strength is defined as functional training is a term used to describe exercises that help you perform activities in everyday life more easily. These exercises typically use the whole body, definitely multiple muscles, and emphasize core strength and stability. Okay, so all of this sounds amazing, right? I mean, we should really be thinking about um, exercising the whole body as no one muscle group is independent from the other. They're, they're all connected. So it's important that we think of that. Ultimately, if we only isolate one muscle group, say, for example, our chest uh, and our shoulders, but we never train our back, what's going to happen is our chest is going to pull us forward. And because our back is weak, it's going to cause our backs to round, which is upper um, thoracic extension. This is a very common uh, muscular imbalance, mainly because a lot of people will do a lot of chest dominant exercises or for a large component of their day, they are either on their phone or sitting at a desk with their hands out front with poor posture as I adjust my posture right now. Um, so we don't want to be training one, one muscle group independently from another. We should really be trying to focus on training the entire body. And then the emphasization on, on core and stability, um, I think ultimately it is definitely a really good thing to train the core because that you know in between your, your core strength and your grip strength, uh, if either of these two are weak, then chances are your whole body will be weak. Um, in terms of stability and strength, um, this is where things get a little bit a little bit um, more difficult to define uh, because ultimately different uh, sports require different levels of stability. But the reality is, is that if you're pursuing strength, chances are you're, go pardon me, you're going to have great stability. The act of balancing on any one particular surface is a skill, and each and every single one is going to require different proprioceptive response. So I'm going to get into that a little bit more throughout the video, um, particularly when I start to showcase some of the, these movements that they have uh, in some of the videos that I've got up here. Um, we'll cover that a little bit more in depthly. Um, what I want to say is that this original term, functional training, was actually implemented when physiotherapists uh, were trying to rehabilitate their clients back to a functional movement pattern, meaning helping them get back to everyday activities. For example, we can think of that in terms of like the the prime six movements, so squat, push, pull, hinge, and carry. Uh, if you are somebody who suffers a really big accident where maybe you are no longer, um, you know, maybe you've actually had all your muscles being torn off the bones in your legs, and now they've reattached those muscles, and those are basically brand new muscles. They're going to have to go through a whole, a whole host of movements in order to be able to um, be activated and for you to have the central nervous system connection in, or, in order to be able to use your legs. Um, so what ends up happening is, is function, functional training is starting with movement patterns that are uh, safe and effective for a client to be able to, um, you know, do them. And there are, in that situation, chances are you're not going to be able to use your, your leg muscles. I've personally torn a calf muscle, and it's, it's amazing just how... Um, fresh and new that calf mu muscle is and how quickly they get tired. So when you look at f functional training from that standpoint, essentially when you go to a physiotherapist, what they're trying to do is rehabilitate your body in a safe way to get you back to those prime movement patterns. Uh, so these are just safe ways for people to be able to start relearning how to use their muscles. Um, and this is where functional training really got coined, was just essentially getting people back to being functional. Think like being able to walk again, being able to squat again, being able to sit in a chair again, all sorts of examples like that. 
Okay. Now, where it's really changed changed in the industry is in terms of sports, and um, you know they really ran with the core stability and balance side of things, uh, as well as trying to also hit on on all the strength fronts. So the ability to do force production and produce a certain amount of force. I've seen videos where people are thinking that if they have a barbell in their hand with two 25 pound plates, um, if they're a kayaker, if all they do is hold on to that barbell and mimic their kayaking rowing, that they're gonna become stronger at kayaking because they're implementing quote unquote a functional um, movement pattern that's similar to what they are doing in their sport with a, with a particular amount of weight. Now. This is where, uh, you know, this brings up the said principle, and I'm going to get into that a little bit further. But first, what I want to showcase to you guys is some of these uh, interesting movements that people are doing. <clears throat> Apologize if the sound there was a little loud, but moving on. Okay, so nothing, nothing too fancy here in terms of you know just utilizing movement and and moving our body. One thing that I want to bring up is like you know this kettlebell is extremely light, um, and one of the problems with these functional training movement patterns is that the amount of weight that people are using is generally very minimal to what they can actually um, like the actual force that their bodies can um, generate. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit more into that as well as, as time goes on in this video. Uh, but um, once again, one of the, the flaws to these quote unquote functional training or functional movement patterns is that you're using suboptimal uh, weight um, in relationship to the amount of force production that you can actually produce. And then you're usually performing exercises that just really are not, are not safe or are, are not realistic, mainly because everything that you're doing in any sport is you are usually standing on a flat surface so it's you moving around the flat surface not the flat not the surface moving away from you and so what you're gonna see here is with this particular video is a lady standing on a BOSU ball and you know trying to maintain balance while this ball is shifting all over the place okay so Here's, here's the interesting thing that I'm trying to, to showcase here. So the said principle essentially applies the... Where did I put it? I put it here somewhere. There we go. So the said principle asserts that the human body adapts specifically to impose demand. So whatever you do to... Um, that is stressful to the human body over time it will find ways to adapt to the stress that you're putting upon it so for example with this lady doing all of these movements her body is getting adapted to performing these movement patterns but it has but it but like she's not doing this in her daily life and i don't know too many sports that mimic the exact movement patterns that they're doing and this is where specificity is, is important because ultimately what, what people really should be doing is they should be pursuing the ability to generate better force production. So getting stronger with heavier weight over, like, like over the entire body. So if you think about the prime six, you're going to think of squat, push, pull, hinge, and carry. So you're going to think of things like deadlifts. You're going to think of things like overhead press, bent over row, clean and jerk. You know, these are great movement patterns that allow you to add a lot of weight to the bar and incrementally increase the amount of force that um, or resistance that you're putting against your body and being having to then generate more force to be able to be stronger. OK, so why perform these suboptimal movement patterns, suboptimal movement patterns in the sense of force production uh, for implementing the basic movements that have been shown time in and time again that they yield the best results i'm you know just sticking with the basics of a squat deadlift overhead press bench press uh bent over row and, and clean and jerk um 
if you can run that fundamental program and you run that program for two or three years and, and you get yourself to a place where you went from, say, doing 135 pound squat to like, you know, 400 pound squat, who's generating more more force production at that point? Well, it's obviously going to be the person who can squat 405. And so one thing that we can look at in terms of force production and how we define that, uh, the summary is on force production the rate of force development rfd is a measure of explosive strength or simply how fast an athlete can develop force athletes with a higher rate of force development have been shown to perform better during numerous physical performances now mark ripito uh, a strength coach at uh, wichita falls uh, he has actually a definition for that uh, which is um, Strength is defined as a force produ produced against an external resistance. And that um, f basically your interaction with the world around you is force production. So everything in life is, is ultimately pushing against you and that it's you against external forces, right? So if you go from uh, a 135-pound squat to a 400-pound squat, you are now in, in, inherently capable of producing greater levels of force now this will transfer over to everything we do in life okay so this is why i personally look at functional training and i kind of give a little bit of a giggle because ultimately one of the things these functional training coaches are forgetting is that they're forgetting their said principle which every coach should should have uh, been educated on pretty heavily in regards to your ability to adapt and become proficient at that task um, and that you're only ever going to be as good as what you practice um, this is why with myself on that previous video when I was talking I had said that um, you know when I was an amazing runner I used to do deprivation sprints and I would be able to pretty much sprint solidly for a good good 10 minutes I mean it was really no difficulty at all because I would hold my breath for an extended period of time and then continue to jog, hold my breath and then continue to jog and just repeat that cycle over and over and over again uh, to the point where I got you know a six kilometer down to nearly uh, 18 minutes. I think at one point I even might have ran it at 16. Could be mistaken about that. That was a long time ago. Um, but uh, my proficiency in running was, was amazing. But then if I ran up a flight of stairs, I instantly would be winded after, you know, maybe I would run up, say, six flight of stairs as hard as I could or something. Um, there just was no carryover. Like, you know, I wasn't practicing running upstairs ever. So when I started to introduce stair running, even though I had great cardiovascular and anaerobic strength, running up a flight of stairs was actually quite challenging. And the only way to be good at running upstairs is to just run upstairs. So... I just want to showcase another video um, on on some of these movement patterns that I, I find just absolutely insane to see. And I've seen some of them as a strength coach working at a gym. I have seen some people do some really weird shit in hopes that that's going to transfer over to their sport and things that they do. And so uh, shout out to this uh, Revival Fitness. Uh, he has actually some really good videos on this particular subject. And uh, he actually, the other day, I had found his videos and he kind of motivated me to kind of change the way that I had made my video just because he had done such a great job. So I invite you guys to take a look at this. Um, you know, I, I think that this would be a really great opportunity for you guys to gain another insider's perspective on functional training. Uh, I'm actually just going to turn off the sound here just because when he talks, uh, it makes it a little bit harder for me to be able to talk. So one particular video is I just wanted to show this lady with her heel on a on a foam roller with a 25 pound plate trying to do a row. And I mean, this this poor woman is just shaking all over the place. And so how does this transfer over to anything that she's going to ever do in life? You know, where in the world do you ever find yourself put into such an awkward situation? OK, and and this is where functional training uh it starts to get really complicated and really weird and i mean people are really doing some really unsafe things um you know we've got uh, one lady the same lady actually performing well let's just move that back a bit 
see if we can get it. <clears throat> so we've got the same lady performing like a, a, a push up with a 45 pound plate on her on her back with her toe on a on a foam roller trying to keep balance. And I mean, that is just not a very safe maneuver. And now we've got her doing these partial squats. Um, and then she, it looks like she's about to curl the weight. And uh, I mean, it's, it's crazy too, because I mean, her toes are pointed forward, her knees are pointed forward, she's got nowhere to go for her pelvis. So she's not even going to go down to a full, full 90 degree angle on her, on her squat. So she, once again, she's not going to be using very heavy weight. Um, you know, this is this is not going to be very force productive. Um, and to me, it just seems like a lot of wasted energy and time when you come to the gym. So I think I've shown a, a good amount of examples uh, as to how silly these movements are. Um, coaches are making a living uh, telling people and teaching people uh, that these are, you know, these are the next best thing to driving their performance. Um, a lot of these athletes, athletes that you are going to notice are actually already highly successful athletes meaning they have already done all the basics you know they've probably gotten to their max level bench their max level deadlift squat and overhead press um, and now they're just doing very light uh, movements that are are very challenging in nature like don't get me wrong you're going to be proprioceptively responding to these very challenging stressful exercises if anything, you're going to be increasing your mental toughness tenfold trying to perform them, which, I mean, sure, I mean, that's that's a good thing. But the, the, the reality is, is that these coaches are selling you the belief that this is what separates them from everybody else. That's just not the case. The reality is, is that most of these people, A, they've, they've practiced the basics for many years, and B, chances are if you're seeing a guy that looks looks like this, all year round is probably on the sauce aka steroids or some sort of SARM or anything other anything else of that nature um, so that separates them okay uh, what I want to what I want to quickly cover on is that um, giving up force production for fancy movement patterns that are complex and removing yourself from doing the basics is otherwise just a just a waste of your time and that everything in, in life is you against external forces and that you should be always trying to get stronger now at some point you know you're going to hit what's called your genetic ceiling and you're not going to be able to um, push uh, the weight the, the any higher you know there, there will literally come a point where you trying to, to uh, deadlift say 500 pounds or you know it's very rare I just want to say it's very rare to have a conventional 500 pound deadlift within the community without the use of drugs um, and uh, if you've got amazing genetics and great moment arms then of course that that can happen um, but most people find that they you know their 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 deadlift tops off at about 450 to 475 and if you're one of those very rare few that actually can manage to pull 500 pounds naturally that's awesome I'm not saying it's not possible but what I will say is that strength at some point tapers off and now it's just more or less about you trying to to maintain the gains that you've you've accomplished um, and still trying to pursue better force production of course but at this point at that higher level caliber of like you are now an advanced athlete you're going to be wanting to just maintaining what you have and trying to prevent any possibility of risk or, or injury uh, of course, then you've got the concept of steroids where a lot of people who then start pushing past the 500 pound deadlift, they are usually, uh, assi they, well, not usually, they are assisted and this uh, allows them to be able to push that envelope a little bit harder. Uh, this is then, you know, territory for muscle tears. Uh, you know, I, this is where people end up tearing their bicep off of their bone because their ligaments and tendons don't grow as quickly as their muscles. Um, you know, and, and of course we can argue that for naturals, but it's so rare for natural athletes to have those sorts of injuries, mainly because the rate of tendon growth and muscle growth growth is pretty much the same. So uh, anyway, going on a little bit of a tangent here, but what I can just say is that when you design a strength building or a, a program, uh, you know, we're not coming into just exercise, we're coming into train, and that our goal should always be to get stronger. 
um, and ultimately we can really simplify our workout programs with the main five bread and butter movements uh, in order to be able to uh, get stronger so then that way uh, later on in, in our career if we want to we can taper back and then start doing some you know we can start doing some additional movements just for the sake of the fact that we love the hot like we love what we do we love bodybuilding we love working out we love feeling the, the um, challenge and discomfort of exercise uh, you know and, and then you can start adding in um, fancier movements and things of that nature mainly for the fact that you're doing it just because you love it um, not because you believe that it's going to have carryover you know bosu ball balancing like a ballerina and think that it's going to have carryover into your everyday life but once again if you can generate better force production it will transfer over to end into everything that you do in life therefore it's more uh, functional um, and we cannot forget the said principle so if you don't plan to be a Bo bosu ball ballerina uh, there is absolutely no point in practicing that what I want to say is that you should just let your sport condition you and come to the gym to train for force production aka strength and it's, that's the end of it you know that's the end of this discussion on that um, anyway I hope that that clears up a few things once again go check out this dude uh, rival fitness he's doing amazing job or doing an amazing job making content and uh, you know, I look forward to seeing more videos from him. And uh, if you've got any questions that you want answered in regards to this this subject, please like leave your leave your comments down below, and uh, you know, um, reach out via my website if you need to. It's universalstrength.com. Uh, I'm currently offering uh, online coaching. Um, you know, ultimately, it's just about support and building a community. If you're somebody that that is motivated to have other individuals. Uh, and you know have uh, the ability to be supported along your journey of becoming the strongest version of yourself I'd love to help you out with that um, you know do you do you need the program you don't need the program over time if you've got the, your own personal ability to educate yourself there's tons of free information out there uh, once again though what you will be getting is just my support and then just the ability to communicate to you whether or not you're doing uh, uh, the program appropriately for safety and um, you know, just have somebody kind of in your in your pocket, so to speak, because it's all done online, uh, to just be able to help you out. Anyway, guys, thanks a lot for listening to this video today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.